To top it all off, she had very recently sought a relationship with WXLT's news anchor George Ryan, only to find that he was already romantically involved with Christine's best friend at the Stanny! Why, Danny? Just before we get started with today's video, I've got some news for you. You're gonna die. I mean, hopefully, a really long time in the future after a happy, healthy life where you die quietly in your sleep, well prepared. But life isn't always like that, and sometimes you might die early. Oh god, what are we doing? This is an advert for Policy Genius and through Policy Genius life insurance. Why get life insurance? Look, if someone relies on you financially, that is kind of a big deal if you're not there to provide that finance anymore. Like this could be the obvious ones you think of, like a partner or a child or something like that. But also, I don't know, maybe you're supporting your parents or uh, maybe you've got a business partner, something like that. Someone who relies on you to some degree financially that if you're not there, it's going to be a problem. So you're young, you're healthy, you might be thinking, I'm going to live forever, Simon. But the good news is, when you're young and healthy, it's uh, actually much cheaper to get life insurance, so that's nice. Another thing you might be thinking, this is such a crazy fact, that people often have life insurance apparently through work, I guess. But people, it says here, people often need up to 10 times more coverage to properly provide for their families. So a uh, good job, workplaces, getting it right there, huh? No. Policy Genius is your one-stop shop to finding life insurance at the right price. Click the link in the description below or go to policygenius.com slash blaze to get started. And in minutes, you can compare personalized quotes from top companies to find your lowest price. You could save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius. Genius. The licensed agents of Policy Genius are on hand through the entire process to help you understand your options so that you can make decision with confidence. Policy Genius team works for you, not insurance companies. Again, you could save up to 50% at policygenius.com slash blaze in now today's video. Hello already, welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. I, as always, am Blaze Boy, also known as Simon Hammonds here. Danny writes me a script. I'm gonna read it. We're gonna have fun together, and afterwards, Sam is gonna add in some of the finest vintage memes that you've ever seen. That's what we do here. The holy trinity of blaze yes let's go oh by the way this is the craziest thing seen on live tv mm-hmm mm-hmm it's gonna get crazy maybe <laughs> baby it perhaps says something about the annual live ceremony for the academy awards that the only occasions on which it's really managed to grab the headlines over the last 90 years is when somebody announces the wrong film as the winner or when an oscar nominee gets up on stage to give the comedian a quick slap in the face before later picking up his award to a standing ovation will smith just smacked the shit out of me that was insanity like will smith obvious <laughs> for anyone to get up in an event like that and do what will smith did it's like will smith has troubles like, whatever is going on in Will Smith's life, it is not good. Because that's some fucked up shit. Like, you've got to be a crazy person to do that. Like, it doesn't matter. He's a comedian. Like, I, I think this is everyone's opinion, right? No one's like, he stood by his woman! No, it's like, you don't punch a comedian in the face. It's like, you, it's, it's like you sit at the front row of a comedy club, and then you get pissed off when you get picked on. You're a celebrity. Jada Pinkett Smith is also a celebrity. It's part of the deal. It's why you get to live in a giant mansion in Beverly Hills. Not sure how they could possibly top their next year. Maybe they can accidentally set the host on fire, except that's already been done to a British TV presenter on an early Saturday morning show for kids. Anthea Turner. Feel like I've heard of Anthea Turner. Had a bit of a reputation being a little unlikable and annoying and perhaps a bit just too artificially enthusiastic about anything. There's nothing worse than that. And I, I feel like Brit generally, other than apparently Anthea Turner, we're, generally British people are quite good at not being enthusiastic about things that they don't care about. When you go to, a, we're, I don't mean to over criticize America on this one, but you go to America, it's like you go into a restaurant, they're like, "Hi, how are you today?" And it's like, "Okay, why are you so? Do we know each other? Why? How are you? I'm good. How are you? Thank you for asking. It feels like." They're overly enthusiastic that I've come to the fine establishment that is Denny's. I went to, uh, I went on a trip recently. I went to Israel. You can still smoke inside in Israel, and it was a blast from my fucking past to go into the restaurant. And the first question they ask is, smoking, non smoking? I was like, I, I feel like I'm eight again and I've arrived at a restaurant with my parents. And also the idea that parents would be like, oh, smoking, please. We're just going to smoke around our children this evening. Because <laughs> it was the 90s and that was okay. The former presenter of Blue Peter and Top of the Pops most likely had to keep smiling and babbling to silence the dark voices in her head. Holy shit, what's wrong with that, Theaterna? 
But as annoying as she might have been, I'm sure not many of the children wanted to see her catch fire on live TV straight after they've been enjoying the rhubarb and custard cartoon. Those people, the kids who were like, oh my god, I saw something awesome today. The TV presenter got caught on fire. We should be watching those kids like we watch the kids who torture cats. Note it down. In 1989, Anthea was... Anthea? Did I say Andrea earlier? In 1989, Anthea was co-presenting a largely forgotten Saturday morning show on the BBC called Up To You, which contained a mix of live location reports, entertainment features, and things to make and do. In this particular episode, Anthea was reporting on the RAF motorcycle display team... RAF motorcycle display team. Aren't the RAF the dudes in the plane? Planes. They're like the Royal Air Force. It's in the name, Simon. Big brain. Why do they have a motorcycle display team? Shouldn't you be doing f***ing planes, RF? What are we doing? <laughs> Who's paying for this? And they'd be performing later at the 99th Royal Tournament, an annual military pageant held in London. Up to you. Keen to show the kids a pretty lame stunt in which some crappy pyrotechnics are set off on the tailgate of a truck as a cue for a stunt motorcyclist to come jumping out of the back and land his bike on the ground. Hardly the wall of death, which is that insane thing where that's that's the thing where the motorcycles go round and they're like uh, using like uh, using my big brain here trying to is it G forces that keep you stuck to that wall as they spin round the outside? Sam, show a video clip. It's absolutely mental. Deja vu. But it was probably quite adequate for the Royal Tournament. Now, the director Thomas Doherty had apparently been warned by the experts that the presenter of this segment should at no time be anywhere near the pyrotechnics, the truck, or the motorbikes. Sounds pretty smart, because it seems, I mean, while lame, still dangerous. So he planted Anthea Turner right next to the pyrotechnics on the tailgate of the truck containing the stunt motorcyclists. <laughs> it's that the negligence is so high that it's almost like he didn't like Anthea and he wanted her to catch on fire and die. The idea was that she would introduce the stunt and then get out of the way before things started going bang. Unfortunately, due to a breakdown in communication between the director and the technicians, the cue for Anthea to begin presenting the live segment was mistaken for a cue to get cracking with the studs. Oh God, this is like someone getting on fire, set on fire is relatively harmless compared to this thing that I read about the other day, which was a woman was standing on a bridge waiting for a bungee jump, right? And she's up there with her boyfriend or whatever, and they signal the boyfriend to jump off, but the woman sees them signaling and jumps off, even though her thing isn't attached, and of course she dies because she's jumping off a bridge. It's a holy sh**. Anthea just had time to cheerfully address the young audience with the strangely prophetic words And if you want something to happen to you on a... Before the pyrotechnics go off, tossing her forcefully off the truck and briefly setting her hair and jacket on fire as the motorcyclist jumps out right next to her I shouldn't find this funny It's really bad Her hair is on fire I'd be really upset if my hair caught on fire Wait a minute and with that, the BBC had resorted to blowing up their children's presenters live on air. To be fair, the actual motorbike stunt looked better than I was expecting. A few seconds later, we cut to a different segment with co-presenter Jenny Powell, who is showing viewers how to build a Death Star out of egg cartons or something like that. <laughs> I remember they had these things like BBC would do this all the time. There was a show called Blue Peter, which would show you how to make like Thunderbird sets out of like paper mache and stuff. Paper mache? Paper mache? Doesn't matter. Thankfully, Jenna does later reassure the young audience with, You might have just seen something a bit dangerous happen to Anthea, but she's okay. She's just gone to first aid, and she's gonna have a nice hot cup of tea. And a hair transplant. <laughs> Holy shit. And if you want something to happen to you on a. <laughs> I'm not convinced that the nice hot cup of tea would have helped much with the burns to Anthea's face or hands or the temporary hearing loss. Oh my god. <laughs> Ah, oh, she was badly injured, like properly. She was off work for a while and her immediate TV show commitments were put on ice, but she eventually returned to annoy the audience for at least another decade or so. She later looked back at the incident and vividly recalls the smell of burning hair and bacon. Is that the, is that because the smell of burning human flesh is like smells like bacon? Ah! The director, Thomas Doherty, was later successfully sued by Anthea for failing to take reasonable care of the safety of the presenter. He was fined a thousand pounds and was given a year's conditional discharge. What is conditional discharge? Does that mean he gets a year off? One of those things that is the biggest surprises to me of all is like, we've suspended them on paid leave. Wait, so they did something wrong and now they're on holiday. What the f 
Is that actually a thing? It could have actually been much worse, though, if Anthea had been sitting an inch closer to the pyrotechnics or the motorcyclist had jumped out an inch the other way, things would have gotten very, very messy. But we learn from our mistakes. The incident is still regularly used in BBC health and safety training courses as an example of how not to make live television. And here's three more examples that could be included in that thrilling training course. Yeah, and I bet you roll into like BBC health and safety, they're like rolling out like a, a, a TV with the giant back, you know, like how TVs used to be really thick. They roll that out and they put in like a VCR, like a video, and they play it and it's all square and they're like, BBC, when did you last update this? And it's like, why would we update something? Why fix something that is not broken? The lines have been cut. You might think a good chef might know a thing or two about preparation, but celebrity Slovakian chef Le Ubermir Urko appeared to be taken by surprise in 2016. Oh my god. Through an incredible... I have not read this before, and I literally saw this video for the first time yesterday. Maybe. This is wild. I know exactly what's going to happen, and it's going to involve cocaine. Jump in there and roll around and all that cascading white powder. He appeared to be taken by surprise in 2016 when the cameras started rolling in his kitchen a little earlier than he anticipated. The kitchen had been set up in the studio of the magazine TV show Tellerain, broadcast on the Slovak channel Markiza. As the main presenters quickly wrapped up another segment, they decided to cut to the kitchen floor to see what Le Ubermeer was up to. And here's what Le Ubermeer was up to. He was using a credit card to cut a pile of mysterious white powder on the worktop into a line positioned elegantly next to a 500 euro banknote. <laughs> and I was like, I looked at that video and no one was commenting in the comments how there was just a 500 euro banknote just rolled up next to it. And I really thought like people doing cocaine through hundred dollar bills is just for movies, right? People do cocaine with whatever. You don't even need a rolled up banknote to do cocaine. Like, you could use, and you definitely don't need a hundred. So, I think people just do it as, like, as part of the faffery around cocaine, right? And also, I've seen, like, 500 euro bills, I think, once in my life, and it wasn't even in Europe. It was a guy who was abroad, and he was changing, like, a big bill for local currency. I think the rest of the time, it's just for crimes. I think they even got rid of it because it was so associated with crime as we see on this TV show. As the camera pans away from the powder in panic, we see a wide-eyed and red-faced Ubermir stare directly down the lens with a grimace before getting on with this segment as if nothing had happened. Now we should point out that both the broadcaster and Ubermir himself have since claimed that this was a gag. Ubermir later claimed during a radio interview that he was just messing around with powdered sugar for a bit of a giggle and apologized if the joke fell a little flat. I think this is actually a really good joke. I think this is something that I, the, the, my problem is this is something that I would do. <laughs> this is the sort of thing that would get me into trouble because I'd be like doing that thinking it's hilarious. And then everyone would be thinking I've got a drug problem. The police would be knocking on my door. They'd be like, why do you have a 500 euro note? And what was that cocaine doing on TV? It's also been observed that the amount of white powder on the worktop would have represented an absurdly large serving of cocaine, even by coca celebrity chef standards. And yet, I'm not buying it. It just doesn't really pan out like it's a deliberate joke, and Ubermir's bulgy-eyed expression immediately afterwards seems like a melting pot of embarrassment, horror, bemusement, and regret. Like a stewed rabbit caught in the headlights. I've seen this clip, and his face is... Mwah. Show it, Sam! And... Play it again, Sam! Okay. It was at this moment that he knew. He fucked up. It is, I think it's just well acted. I think it's a gag. Danny disagrees with me. What? It is very well acted, but it is no one does that much coke. It's a pile of coke. Although the police requested a recording of the broadcast, it doesn't appear as if any further action was taken by Le Ubermir or the TV station and the chef's coconut fairy cakes are still as popular as ever. Full house. Here's another handy tip for would-be criminals, which is almost right up there. We don't write down your crimes. Ooh. Danny's been watching my uh, my podcast or listening to my podcast, The Casual Criminalist. You should check it out. It's a true crime show. It's uh, I also read scripts that are written by other people because I'm lazy and creatively bankrupt. If you're planning on robbing the cash jackpot from a poker tournament, try and make sure that it's not a tournament that's being broadcast on live TV. This is one of those examples of a crazy moment which probably didn't make much sense to baffled viewers at the time, but feels more shocking in hindsight after you'd discover what was going on. In 2010, the five-day European poker tournament was held in Berlin and broadcast on German TV with a 1 million euro jackpot at stake. But then something a little unusual appeared to unfold. One of the players suddenly looks back over his shoulder to have a nosy at the commotion that's 
kicked off in the background. Tables are being flipped all over the place. Glasses are smashing. There are screams from the audience, and eventually, all of the players just flee the poker table in terror. The camera lingers for a while on the empty table as the broadcasters figure out what to do next. Poker isn't usually supposed to get this exciting. <laughs> And all the poker players there are just sat down, they're not moving, they're just like stone face cold. The Hyatt Hotel venue had actually been stormed by four young burglars wearing ski masks and wielding assault rifles and massive knives while looking to bag the jackpot. Wait, 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 wait. It's, it's, unless, is it really gonna be just some like, who wants to be a millionaire? I don't know, do they do this in the American version? Like, in the UK version, they had like 50 pound notes in this like glass cabinet beneath the place where the player sits. But also, like, counterintuitively, Chris Tarrant's also writing out checks. So I'm not really sure what's going on. Do they write you a check? Or then when someone wins a million pounds, do you just walk off with the cash underneath the thing? Because that sounds like, that sounds dangerous. <laughs> They're not going to have the million euros in the casino. Whoever wins is going to get like a check or a bank transfer, because that's how money works in the real world, no? It was initially reported that they made away with the whole 1 million euros. Never mind, apparently it was in the hotel. Did Danny say it was in the hotel? Because I might have not been paying attention, even though I am reading this. Why are you the way that you are? But it was later revealed that thanks to the actions of a brave security guard who snatched back one of the bags, they only got away with a paltry 240,000 euros. Thankfully, nobody was seriously hurt in the chaotic stampede. The head of the German police union later declared that the burglars had left behind a mountain of evidence and the robbers had plunged to new depths of stupidity. All the burglars were ultimately caught and sentenced to three years each in prison. Uh-oh. <laughs> One of the poker players, Kevin McPhee, was initially intensely critical of the decision to carry on with the tournament just 90 minutes after the incident, feeling that everyone should have been given time to take a breather and perhaps have a nice hot cup of tea. But he probably wasn't complaining by the end of it when he walked away with the jackpot. Do you think he only walked away with 760,000 euros? The, the tournament's like, we're not eating that. You've got to pay for it. <laughs> Jesus. And then just Kevin walks away with just a bag of cash. And the robbers are outside being like, give us your bag of cash. Fuckwad. Another one of the poker players participating in the tournament was disgraced tennis star Boris Becker, who's been in the news recently. Boris Becker's story is absolutely mental. He's like this tennis star, like major. He's like got to have been world number one. He's one of the most famous tennis players in history. And then he's he's in uh he's in, been in court and he's just got sentenced to jail, prison in the UK, because he was like. He had a company or like he was doing some investments and he took a bunch of money and then he said he was bankrupt that he was hiding all this money and the judge was like Boris we told you about this and he's like I did nothing wrong and throughout the whole thing the judge was like Boris aren't you sorry at all like Boris what's going on and the Boris was like no I did nothing wrong or something like this and the judge is like Boris then you're going to prison <laughs> it's not true it's bullshit I did not it feels like he got so many outs and he still ends up in prison. Oh, and also the diplomatic immunity thing was amazing. He was like, no, 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 you can't prosecute me for this. I'm a diplomat. I have diplomatic immunity. And it turns out, turns out he had some like stolen diplomatic passport that he'd bought from like the Central African Republic. And it's like, Boris Becker, what the f you up to? Allegedly. Although bearing in mind most recent developments, he's unlikely to be returning to the poker in the immediate future. That's because he's in prison. He may be more likely to be cheating at Monopoly with the guys who robbed the joints. <laughs> Trigger warning. Finally, here's one of the more dramatic ways to quit your job as a newscaster. In 1974, 29 year old Christine Chubbick began. Oh, is this the one where the woman kills herself on live TV? Danny, I hope it's not, because that one is f intense. And it is not how I want to end today's episode, because we were just having a laugh at Boris Becker. And. And. No! Please be more gentle than this. Don't do it! 29-year-old Christine Chubby began reading her final news segment for the small WXLT TV station based in Sarasota, Florida, known locally as TV40. This itself was unusual as she wasn't even meant to be reading the news at the time. Christine was supposed to be presenting the Suncoast Digest show, which focused more on local personalities and chat with guests in studio. But she had requested to read out a few important news items before launching into the main show, and her odd request was granted. The last story she covered concerned a restaurant shooting from the previous day, but the accompanying film reel stalled about halfway through, and we cut back to Christine at the news desk. Christine calmly addresses the camera with, in keeping with the WXLT practice of presenting the most immediate and complete news reports of local blood and guts news, TV40 presents what is believed to be a television first, in living color, and exclusive coverage of an attempted suicide. Oh my god, Danny, you did it. What the f***? Christine then pulls out a 38 caliber Smith & Wesson 36 revolver and shoots herself behind the ear, falling forward violently from the impact. The screen 
fades to black. Danny, I don't even know what to say, mate. This is... I don't like it. I, I don't... I recorded Casual Criminalist once today. I've had enough death and horror. No! The channel swiftly replaces Sunco's Digital with a movie. The studio guests slump off back home after a completely wasted journey. Christine dies 14 hours later in hospital, having become the first person in history to commit suicide on live TV. Just when you thought that things couldn't get any creepier, there's one more news item to add to this story. When the notes on Christine's desk were later examined, they were found to contain a handwritten follow-on story for the station to broadcast on her behalf, which explained that she was now in critical condition in hospital and also announced details of her replacement for the show. So. Why did she do it? Her final message to the audience appears to indicate that she wasn't happy with the gruesome shock stories that WXLT insisted on covering, and it was said that she wanted the station to get back to presenting everyday stories with everyday people. But the truth is probably a little more painful. Christine was very lonely and suffering from depression. She often talked to her colleagues about her lack of romantic life and bemoaned the fact that she was still a virgin at 29. Her brother reckons that she only ever had two relationships, one of which ended tragically in a car crash, whilst the second fell apart because the guy was Jewish and Christine's father angrily opposed the relationship. Ah, yes, nothing like a little bit of anti-Semitism. Oh, it was the 1970s. Still not okay, but, uh... Yeah, still not okay, was it? <laughs> she had recently moved back to her old family home and painted her old room to replicate it belonging to a nine-year-old girl. She should have got some help, really, shouldn't she? This is... Danny, this is so sad. Did we have to end here today? Christina recently lost an ovary to assist, reducing her chances of ever becoming pregnant. Danny, why?! And her family later revealed that she had attempted an overdose on drugs. Danny! Danny! Why are you the way that you are? To top it all off, she had very recently sought a relationship with WXLT's news anchor, George Ryan, only to find that he was already romantically involved with Christine's best friend at the... St Danny! Why, Danny? Her final message to the audience used the word suicide attempts, and it's curious that her handwritten follow-on story predicted that she was in critical condition rather than dead. Yet Christine had also specifically requested to run a segment on common suicide methods on the show just prior to her final broadcast, possibly as an unusual method for gathering her own research on the station's dollar. Danny, if I ever asked you to put together a piece on like most effective suicide techniques, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe call someone for me. <laughs> But what happens to the footage? And why isn't exactly regularly wheeled out on wacky blooper shows? Holy sh me, is that really a question? I mean, obviously because it's horrible and let's ne let never let anyone see someone kill themselves. No one wants to do that. Like, I know this exists on the internet and it's on places on the internet I've never been and never want to go. Like, does that I don't even know, bleep it out. I don't even want to say it because I heard about it and it disturbed me just knowing that it exists. So bleep out what I just said, Sam, I'm sorry. Well, it's estimated that only a few hundred or maybe a few thousand viewers at most actually saw the one and only broadcast. This was long before the days of widespread home recording, and surprisingly, it wasn't even widely reported in the media. 1974 must have been a busy news year. The station's owner, Robert Nelson, kept the only known recording, which was eventually passed into his, onto his widow to throw into the bay. But out of respect for her late husband's wishes, she passed it on to a large law firm for safekeeping. What are you doing? What are you doing? An amateur recording surfaced on the Internet Archive for the first time in 2021, which is supposedly genuine, but the quality is terrible. Not that I'd recommend watching it if it was available in Ultra HD. Just don't watch it at all. Don't even seek it out. Why? Why would you do that to yourself? Danny, come on. That would be a real slap in the face for common decency. Danny, why did we end here? This has been an episode of Brain Blaze. Thank you so much for watching. Um, I don't know what to say. The ending of this video was horrible. Please come back next time. I'll miss you if you don't. And if you want something to happen to you on a... Ah!